All right, hello everybody. This is Jason Augustus Newcomb, and we are inside the magic circle once again. And today I am talking to a fascinating magician and artist. Her name is Carrie Michael Leach, and she is an adept of the Golden Dawn. She's also a practitioner of Solomonic magic, as well as an initiate in Palo Mayombe, um, all of which inform both her art and her magic. Um, she is she also runs the, the website Doc Solomons with, uh, coincidentally, her husband, um, Aaron Leach. And together they also own, I, I've already, I'm already gonna mess it up, so Solomon Farms, <laughs> Solomon Springs Farms, which is a, which is a, a camping Solomon venue. For, okay. It's a camping venue for, for events that they, are, that they are just getting up and running right now. And um, we're very excited. I'm actually hoping to, Pay them a visit because they only live a few hours away from me um, and I might get some footage of that at some point in the near future. So Carrie Michael Leach, thank you very much for being here. How are you doing today? Wonderful Jason, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I am really excited to talk to you um, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, particularly I'm, I'm interested in the integration between the Golden Dawn and the Solomonic magic, because both of those are very, you know, solidly a part of, of uh, I know your and Aaron's life together, but I'm curious how they, how they, how they are in your life. How, how, much, how, how much do you lean towards the Solomonic and how much do you lean towards the Golden Dawn? Um, well, it just kind of depends on what we're doing because, you know, we don't, um, we don't mix the two systems. We practice them both very separately. Um, so whenever we're doing Golden Dawn stuff, um, which in a normal year we're doing, you know, at least once a month meetings, doing initiations, those kinds of things, um, at home work. Um, but then whenever we're doing Solomonic stuff, it's strictly Solomonic. And at least here at home, that is the majority of what we do. Is the um, Solomonic? Just simply because. Uh, yeah, is the Solomonic, uh, just simply because of the business and all the work that we do for mm -hmm. clients and ourselves, but we have a lot of work for clients that we do as well. Sure, so and, and you actually, it's, it's an interesting. you are actually the, a, a lot of the art that comes out of Doc Solomon's is your work, yes? It is, it is, um, and almost all of the artwork is mine. Uh, some of the things, um, one of uh, our guys will work on cleaning up through computer if we're needing like vector images off of talismans or whatever. Um, but yeah, most of it, I'd say a good 90% of it at least is my art. Now, I'm going to say you and I met for the first time when I took initiation in, in you know, Chick Cicero's Golden Dawn really only, I mean, I guess it was quite a few years ago at this point, but it, it was late, late into my career that I decided <laughs> to do that. <laughs> um, so, so I, I remember the first time that I met you, you were, you were, you had your sort of uh, uh, an art pad out and you were doing this beautiful calligraphy. At what point did you start doing that calligraphy? I was about eight when I started doing calligraphy. Um, so amazing. it's been a really long time. Well, I mean, yeah, you can tell I picked it up. I had terrible handwriting. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you can tell that you're a, you're a master at calligraphy, both in the things that you were doing then and all the things that you've been doing since then. I mean, there's a beautiful artwork coming out of your out of your hands. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's been. I don't think there's any artist out there that doesn't go through as they're progressing in their career expanding always learning always refining their art mm -hmm. especially whenever you get into very technical things um there's always new techniques to learn new ways of i like to experiment a lot too just to see if i can make something that much better so it's it's really grown and um you know especially with all the art that i've been able to do over the last five six years with doc solomon's um I sometimes I surprise myself. <laughs> You've been making a lot of really cool um, hand painted circles that I've seen. Um, how often do you get to do that? Is that something that you're doing fairly regularly? 
Uh, yeah, usually, um, you know, 2020 aside, because <laughs> it's just, it's not been a normal year. Mm -hmm. um, but on a, on a typical schedule, I'll, I'll do sometimes three, four or five circles in a year, just depending on the size and the complexity of them. You do uh, such the last one I did was um, a nine point. You do such a nice job of sort of laying them out in a very technical way. Like everything is is so even and precise in the way that you the way that you do your art. I'm, I'm quite <laughs> envious of your ability to focus in that way. I'm much more of sort of like a spontaneous person. <laughs> yeah, it's it it definitely because I'm I'm kind of like that throughout a lot of my life. So everything has to. You wouldn't know it by looking at my house, but everything kind of has to be in a, a very precise manner whenever I'm working. It's uh, funny, be it's just funny because simply I so I don't forget anything. Because I'm I want to mention to the people watching this that Carrie lives somewhat rurally now on a farm, and so her you know wireless connection is a little off. That's why there's a little bit of delay happening here and there. Um, so you have to be patient with us a little bit so that we can. We can get through this interview and have it be really wonderful. We're just going to have to like uh, accept the fact that there's <laughs> going to be certain technical limitations. Um, when I was actually looking at my working space today and I was thinking about you and Aaron because you guys, like me, you have a lot of different sort of things that you that you do. You know, you, you've got a lot of different grimoires that you create art from. You've got a lot of different products, some of which are liquid, some of which are wax. How do you manage that space? Because I struggle <laughs> with that incredibly. Um, now I have the ability to have a lot of things separate, fortunately. Um, I have an area just for doing calligraphy and painting. I have an area that um, I just have for working on kind of larger projects. I have an area where I work on um, clay masters for some of the molds that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then um, a lot of stuff is just stored kind of in our temple and Aaron will take over the kitchen to make candles and <laughs> it's, but whenever we were still um, back living in Tampa in a very small house, it was a lot of pick up and move this out of the way to do this particular project and then go back to whatever, because. <laughs> I'm usually working on four or five, six different projects at once. Sure. So some of them take a little less time than others. But yeah, it was it was a lot of juggling. But we're a lot more fortunate now. We don't have to do so much juggling and, and worry about things getting messed up in the process. Well, I have a, I have quite a decent sized house myself, but I still find my I find that the uh, there's, there's just, there's never enough room for it all. And there's, I, I have, I have three children, so I have to constantly move stuff just because of them. <laughs> um, so I, I want to, I, 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 I want to talk about sort of your magical path though. So at what point in your life did you realize that magic was going to be, um, you know, sort of at, at the center of your, of your world? Oh, goodness. Um at the center of my world probably not long after i got in the golden dawn because i i joined i took my new, i took my neophyte when i was 23. oh wow yeah. and um as soon as i did that, yeah <laughs> um so as soon as i did that i just i walked in there and i knew and i knew that was going to be a very big part of my life and just as things progressed and we got further into Solomonic magic, you know, for a long time up until, I guess it was about 2008 or nine, I was working regular jobs, um, sometimes hotels, sometimes uh, various other things, um, just, just to have a paycheck so I could do this. How did you discover the Golden Dawn as something to join? Um, actually, I, Aaron had had the books uh, for quite a while, um, but there was a period where we had broken up for about six months, and during that time, he actually went out and met Chicken Tabby, and then um, I think it was March of 98 or so, he went and took his initiation. Then we started talking again, and um, 
found out that he was gone. I'm like, really? Well, this is this is a change from what we had talked about before. Because uh, <laughs> before what we had, been up, about he had really been that interested. Um, well, he had just gone through Abermellon. Um, he didn't really, before that point, he didn't think that he was going to be joining the Golden Dawn. But then he was directed to do so, and he did. And then I did it about eight or nine months later. And it was the best thing I ever did. Yeah, I think that Aaron and I actually argued a bit over a Yahoo group, um, probably not too long after that time period about Aubrey Malin. And we still argue about it to this day. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so uh, at, at what point did the Paolo Mayombe come into it? Uh, that actually happened before I got in the Golden Dawn. Um, previous, even previous to that, um, I'd been involved in Wicca, a couple other things, and um, again through Aaron, um, I met uh, Stuart Myers, who a lot of people these days know as Oshani Lele. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a little over a year ago. Um, but I met him and he was kind of at the beginning of uh, his journey into Santeria and Palo and um, just studying ATRs and all. And um, at that point, he had been initiated um, within Palo. And uh, it just, whenever I would listen to him, because we would get, he was working overnight in a shell station. And I would, Aaron would go, or I would go, or both of us would be there, and we would just sit there and listen to him talk and tell all these stories and um, these experiences. And it just, it was, it was much the same thing that pulled me like the Golden Dawn did. There was just something I had to do there. And again, I'm very fortunate to have had him as, as a teacher within that system. So I was I was about twenty one or twenty two when I started Paulo. And uh, Paulo, and then the Solomonic magic. Where did where did that come in? Um, Aaron had been working on um, the working through the Grim Wars, trying to learn what they were all about, mm -hmm. and there are uh, just a lot of similarities between um paulo uh santeria various other uh african traditional religions and old solomonic magic learning that made a lot of this made make sense um sure. so just kind of started going more into that direction as well and it just Everything just kind of took on a life of its own. <laughs> you folks, I think, receive a little bit of, of uh, flack for, for sort of, you know, combining um, ATRs with Solomonic stuff. Do you, do you think that that, I mean, I, but I think that nonetheless, that has sort of become a pretty common belief for a lot of people that those things do go together well. Um, and in fact, I mean, if you look at, sort of like the 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 history of 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 that sort of world those grimoires were always a part of that you know i mean they they were they were printed in these like little cheap versions and they were and they were being circulated all through the americas um for the last couple hundred yeah. years so yeah especially yeah especially your uh the fifth and sixth books of uh Wow, just went out of the fifth and sixth books. Six and seventh books of Moses, yeah. Moses? Yeah, six and seventh books of Moses. That's yeah. it. Thank you. Sorry, because I my brain just totally went on a ride there. <laughs> yeah. Could not dig it out. But anyhow, um, especially that particular room where there's a, mm -hmm. a couple other ones. Um, sometimes you'll see people with a greater key of Solomon mm -hmm. uh, as well. But one thing, it, we don't combine the two systems but one has informed the other. Sure. Because the, there's so much of, um, especially the way you look at spirits within that tradition. 
you know, they're not just some part of your psyche. These are actual real entities. Uh, just as real as you or I, you just can't see them in that way. So that was, that was one of the things that really, I think, influenced not only our Solomonic practice, but also our Golden Dawn practice too. And, and how, how did it influence your Golden Dawn practice? That's interesting to me. Um, kind of the same idea that the angels that we work with, the gods that we work with, um, they are also real. They're not just parts of our psyche. Now, as far the way that I look at it, yes, it does affect your psyche, but it's not just solely coming out of your head. Sure. You know, these guys are real. Um, and it's, it's interesting because over the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, 10 or 15 years, this is kind of expanded because, you know, we set up altars to all the angels in our house. And um, I guess, it, like I said, it's been a number of years now, but we actually went into temple and did uh, set up an altar and did a whole offering. I think it was to Yophiel, if I remember correctly, before an invocation of Yophiel. And, you know, while our golden dawn rituals are always very powerful and there's always some effect from them, that seemed to hit people a little harder than normal. So it's, it's kind of grown and now, um, you know, whenever we do have temple, very often we'll have a Raphael altar set up after, after we've done our ritual and we're sitting around you know, fixing to eat dinner and all. Uh, Tabby will set up a Raphael altar and we'll have incense and candles and people can take up petitions or talk to them or what have you. And that was something that we didn't do up until Aaron and I started that part of the process. So a question that I really like to ask people uh, is what, what do you see the spirits as being and how do they relate to a hierarchy? Are you, are you operating within a Judeo-Christian perspective? In which case, where do the, the old gods that come into it fit in? And you know, what, where do they live? Do they exist? in a in a particular space on the planet or do they exist in a dimension how do you how do you sort of put that together in your own consciousness um well you know we do we do work within a gnostic framework as far as as like religion goes um so there is definitely a hierarchy there um but as for where these guys live, just in the ethers among us, um, and certain spirits seem to have particular homes. Um, and also, uh, it kind of depends on, uh, like we have uh, consecrated statues, and part of that spirit lives within that statue. Um, Right. If so, you're familiar at all with uh, Eastern Orthodox. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to say, well, if the spirit is living in the statue at, to a certain extent, um, that's a, is that the, is that the same spirit that, you know, if, if uh, Frater Ashen Shasan is calling a, a spirit at the same time, is that spirit the same or, do, or is there like a more, <laughs> you know, in a more, um, There's, there does seem to be a little bit of a difference. You know, they're, they're all part of, let me see if I can, if I can describe this in a, in a way that will make sense. You have, you know, take Michael, for instance, mm -hmm. you have the Archangel Michael, the planetary force, the, the big guy. And whenever we have statues like this or whatever it's just a very small part of that particular of michael and like say if you had michael or father Sean has michael 
they will be a little bit different. Um, it's kind of the same way in Apollo, Santeria, Ifa, what have you. You know, you have these these spirits, but each one, whenever you're working with it, it's it's almost <laughs> I kind of hate to use this this imagery, but it's almost like a tentacle of that particular okay. deity um, that you're working with, and they do very much. There's similarities, but there are definitely some differences in between which who you have and who you're working with. So yours would be different. Ashan's would be different. Um, is is that but because, not unrecognizably different? You're you're dealing with sort of a, a a a representative of the being or an emanation of the being rather than the the essential essence of the being, or is it because there are a lot of beings that have the same name and function? How does that work? I would say a little bit of all of that. It's definitely um, because it is an emanation of that entity. Um, but then you have, like say you're doing a full invocate or a full evocation, that one may be, you know, because that's gonna be even, like you're trying to contact the, the larger entity, you're trying to contact the larger Michael. And even that will be a little bit different than just the one that we have sitting here. Um, can, can I yeah, have there's, a, there's lots of times that, Can I have a full evocation of Michael at the same time that you're having a full evocation of Michael and us both be talking to Michael at the same time? Or does Michael send a representative to one of us who like just puts on Michael's hat and says, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm Michael. <laughs> how, how does that work? Personally, I think it is it is kind of like the emanation or representative of him. They are so large and they are so, it's beyond, I think, what humans can really comprehend, mm -hmm. their vastness. Um, so yeah, they're, I mean, I'm sure it's happened at some point in history, uh, especially going on nowadays. Yeah, I mean, where, there's so many yeah, magical you know, practices feast days, that kind of thing. Everybody's doing evocations. Everybody's trying to contact these entities. And I've not yet really run across anyone that says, you know, this, this Michael that showed up, this isn't, this isn't who I thought it was. Um, most everybody seems to have some kind of relationship with that entity, with mm -hmm. Michael, with Raphael, with whoever. Um, you know, I mean, I guess it will happen on occasion where people will end up getting something that calls itself Raphael or calls itself Michael. Um, but that seems to be rather unusual. So, um, when you, you, you have altars, obviously, to a lot of beings, and um, how often do you utilize a more circle kind of a relationship? Are you, are you often in a circle doing uh, a, like a, a traditional sort of conjuration sort of work, or are you more often just doing devotional work? Anymore, it's more often devotional work. Um, you know, we'll do invocations to them while, before, uh, as we're opening up the altar. We'll do their invocations, we'll do their prayers before we go on with any petitions. Um, but we, we do occasionally still work up a full evocation and um, not as often as we used to, but it's definitely still part of the practice. Do you um, think that, do you think yeah, that? And I will say, sorry. One thing I wanted to add to that is, I will say is we went on through our practice and, and developed relationships with these angels and with a variety of gods and spirits. Um, that's like what set that relationship is the work that we would do within Magic Circle, the work, you know, the evocations, the prayers and whatnot. But once we have really established that relationship, I can go out there and, you know, light the candles and incense and do the invocation to 
one of them and they are there just as much as they would have been say 10 years ago in a full evocation so continually working with them continually building that relationship i think is something that's very very important too do you see it as a necessary step to do the sort of uh, evocationary work that you were doing early on or do you think that people can just move to the devotions and develop a relationship more purely devotionally without the sort of circle and trappings i think they can i think they can i think it's best to do it you know through through official channels if you will um you know really showing them that you're serious but i know of a number of people that um have developed their practice um through setting up altars and through a more devotional practice rather than um you know just straight up magic um and it seems to work very well for them you know there's people out there that i know i can see in their work i can see in the things that they post sometimes pictures that they post that that entity is there and that whoever they're working with is doing good work in their lives. So it's absolutely possible. It may take a little bit longer and that, that really depends, I think, on the person too. Do you think that the Golden Dawn work is useful towards, you know, I know that you keep them separate, but do you think that that work is useful toward um, the, uh, the other more spirit oriented work? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as you go through and in a variety of ways. Um, for me, um, it has given me, because I'm kind of a natural seer. It's one of the things, one of the reasons why I got into magic to begin with. And it was very hard years ago to get that to focus and to not just have these random spirits coming in and out um but with the golden dawn it, it very much got my my brain into an area where i can focus and i can have conversations with these guys and really shut out some of the extraneous stuff that may be going on mm -hmm. um then there's also um people will talk about spiritual authority um which i think is something that's highly recommended <laughs> um, because it does give you authority over also especially once you make it through all the elements, you get through the outer order and go to the inner order that initiation definitely gives you a spiritual authority um, the same thing if someone is ordained a priest in a in a uh, church or someone has uh, taken the OSHA initiation and Santeria, all of those types of things give one spiritual authority. Um, but it doesn't stop just there. You have to you have to keep working. You have to show them that yeah, you really are who you are. You really are who you say you are. You do have this authority. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely helped us, and I think it's. I think it helps most people if they do develop some kind of authority over, especially your, your more Catholic spirits. It's like, hey, I speak in the name of God. You have to listen. So I, we, I don't think, because I see sometimes people run into trouble and I, I've not really had that experience. Well, the reason that I ask the question is because mm -hmm. quite, quite a few sort of mm -hmm. Solomonically oriented or grimoirically oriented or Chthonic spirit oriented magicians these days don't really see a lot of value in the old, you know, 19th century um, initiatory structure at all. Um, but but I but I I'm, I appreciate that you share that perspective that it it actually does have a spiritual, <laughs> you know, a spiritual uh, power behind it that that is something that does grant <laughs> authority. But that's, that's interesting. Um, I wonder how many people that have trouble with their rituals would have less so if they, you know, did a sort of an initiatory, you know, trek through something. Um, I want to talk to you about the kinds of rituals that you that you 
work when you're doing more formal rituals. Um, do you stick to sort of the 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 stuff that Aaron wrote about in you know Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, or or are there new areas or other areas that influence the kinds of rituals that you guys do? Um, no, we tend to pretty stick to stick to the book in that way. <laughs> um, whenever we do uh, full evocations anymore, it is very much in in a Solomonic way. You know, we'll go through both go through and take the Solomonic purification baths. Anything that needed to have any consecrations or whatever done on a particular day at a particular time are still done. Um, and the evocation itself, you know, we always do according to um, timing, magical timing. Um, and, do you, you know, do you follow the, the lists of prayers and the lists of psalms and all of it. Do you follow more a, an astrological uh, method or, or the planetary hours method in the way that you approach that? Actually, both, because, you know, we do want to make sure that, um, astrologically speaking, you know, that everything's good, the stars are good, but then we also have to get those to align with um, the timing as outlined in the grimoires. So it can be really tricky sometimes. Sure. Um, there was a lot of 2020 that it was just, it was almost impossible to get anything done because the astrology was so bad for most of the year. Um, you know, we have, uh, anytime we move anywhere, we do, um, it's an operation out of um, the mixed Kabbalah. And um, we do seven beeswax talismans to Samael to set around our, whatever, wherever we're living at the time. And we hadn't been able to do that until this past November. Hmm. Because it was either Mars was in retrograde, Mars was in the wrong sign. It was the, I mean, just trying to get these things to line up sometimes is so difficult. But I also think it's something that, you know, each little thing lends its own power. You know, we were talking about spiritual authority, developing relationships with these entities. Mm -hmm. I happen to have a very, very good relationship with Samuel. Um, that said, he is also, he, he, he can be a little difficult to work with sometimes, just being Mars and all. So I want to make sure that whenever I approach him, especially whenever we were doing a big working like that, that he's in a really good mood and really wants to help. <laughs> so approaching him at the right time and in the right manners with his favorite foods and offerings and whatnot, each little bit adds something to it to create something bigger, something more powerful. How do you generally know whether a spirit or an angel is in a good or bad mood? Well, again, the astrology generally uh, informs a lot of that. Um, but whenever we're coming up to a big working or a big feast day or what have you, um, there's, there's a general feeling whenever you're kind of working with a particular entity. Um, and I kind of run into it. It's, it's almost like sometimes they're just, they're not in the mood to deal with you. They've got something else going on. You're just like, okay, I, I don't know what's going on, but you know, here's, here's your flowers. Here's your incense. Here's your water. I'll, I'll, I'll come back another time. Um, but a lot of times as we're coming up to, um, these feast days or evocations or what have you um there's a there is a definite shift in their in the way they relate there's a different feeling to it and um you know some of them it can really seem like again going back to samuel um sometimes it seems like he's not in a very helpful mood um, we've had some very interesting things happen through the years as we've worked with him. Um, but then you get to the, the actual evocation or, or the um, feeding or whatnot. And 
it hits you. And it's like, he's there, there's no question, and this is how things are going to go down. So um, the, but the again, reason, like I said, the astrology, whenever you're working up to those things, definitely helps. The reason that I asked the question is I want to shift to um, talking about uh, your your seership in a second. But I have one, I have one uh, practical question that's just popped into my mind as you've been speaking. Um, so you you off, you give a lot of offerings sure. you give a lot of offerings to um, spirits and, and angels um, and and there's and there's um, there's a couple of matters with that like first of all what do you see the angels as doing with the offerings like what is the, what is the benefit for them in the offerings and and secondly um, what do you do with the offerings once you feel that they've had enough time with them I know in certain um, a, a, ATR uh, kinds of situations you you end up eating the, the offerings but um how, how long do you leave them and what do you do with them um we generally leave them the number of days that are associated so if we're working with michael we'll leave them on the altar for six days mm -hmm. if we're working with rafael we'll leave them for eight days um and the way that I see it, they're absorbing that energy just as much as they're absorbing the energy out of candles, out of fresh water. Um, and since, you know, I, I can't remember the exact passage out of the Bible, but it's, you know, the idea of your prayers rising to heaven on the incense smoke, but they're, they're absorbing these things. And one of the interesting because a lot of people are like oh you leave food on an altar for like eight or nine days doesn't it go rancid doesn't it get nasty and it's like it tends to just dry out it's very very rare that we'll see any any kind of real decay with these offerings um now that is something that one can also use to see if they are accepting the offering too um you know say you've you've worked with Cassiel and he's you're only supposed to leave his offerings for three days and yet after a day you've already got flies buzzing around it you've got mold growing on it you know it's just it's something there's something about it he didn't like and that's one of the ways that they can use to communicate that something either wasn't right with the ritual or something wasn't right with the offerings something you know a lot of times you'll have to use divination to figure out exactly what's going on um but generally speaking they just dry out and whatever the physical matter is is left behind um so that's how i see them as as actually eating their offerings and whenever we are whenever we do reach the point to where it's time to take them off we generally take them any any food we'll take down to the river course any kind of um you know the plates or whatever we just we'll wash and we, each of them have their own plates um and dishes and stuff but um the glass from the candles we'll we'll reuse um but the food itself the flowers wine water anything anything like that anything organic gets taken to a flowing water source interesting so you you put it in the river or you just put it by the river? Well, we'll put it in the river. Well, there you go. That's how the leeches do it. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, so so let's shift gears uh, over to talking about your seership because um, uh, you mentioned that that you that you have a knack for that and the, and and a lot of people who I've been talking to don't and um, i'm curious how you, how your relationship with the spirit world is different in that you feel that you you do you do find it easy to connect with that that space how much does your personal vision inform the work that you do it, it i guess it informs pretty much everything i do <laughs> because you know, I, fortunately, I'm not someone that has to actually work at it to see these guys. Um, 
one of my other practices that uh, we didn't get into yet was um, ancestor veneration, mm -hmm. um, which is something I learned out of, out of my Apollo training. And so I have a whole ancestor bovida set up and I all the time am talking back and forth with them. I can feel them. Sometimes I can see them. Um, some of my ancestors are more powerful than others. Um, sometimes like I'm walking around the house and I will see something out of the corner of my eye or I will see um, like the icon of Michael that I painted that's on his altar. I will actually see him walk into that painting um, and just going through life. I also, um, I kind of got out of the practice. I'm trying to get back into it now. Um, but I go out walking and I have run into so very many spirits out when I'm doing this because it's a very meditative thing and you kind of get into that mindset. And sometimes they are just there. Um, when we were in Tampa, um, sometimes I would run into, I kid you not, I ran into Elegua at least twice. Um, I saw Oshun. I mean, just like I, just as I can see you, I saw them. And I'm just, I'm trying not to walk around with my mouth hanging down and people looking at me like I've got three heads, but it was just, it was so intense and so amazing to see these guys pretty much flesh. And I don't know how often that happens to others. So it's, it definitely informs not just my practice, but my life. Does that happen in ritual space as well? And um, do, you, do you feel that you can do that consciously? Because you mentioned you were out walking and you, you happened to see them. Does the same thing happen when you are doing a ritual to call upon them? Or is that only sometimes? It can. It absolutely can. Um, there's been several times where, you know, I was sitting in Golden Dawn Temple and I'm in some people can like feel things, but I'm seeing, you know, sometimes like say Osiris, sometimes Horus, um, but I can see them, like sometimes they'll be standing right behind the person's seat. Like say it's, it's Horus, sometimes I can see him sitting behind the, the Hyrus's throne. Um, Sometimes I just kind of see things move through the temple because um, there's there's so <laughs> there's I think a lot of people don't know just how many um, deities, gods, what angels, spirits, what have you that fill up a golden dawn full golden dawn temple. And if you can go out and really look at it on an astral level, it is amazing to see. And. And how, how do those spirits interact with one another? You mentioned some, um, you know, Orishas, and you mentioned some angels, and you mentioned some gods. Are they all, do they all play well together? <laughs> how, does that, how does that work? Yeah, generally speaking, now in Temple, I've not really seen, like, the ATR spirits or anything. Um, I have had one or two show up just as we were talking about them, it was kind of like popping in to go, mm -hmm. oh, well, this is interesting, but it's not really their space, you know? Um, but just within my own world, um, everybody kind of seems to play well together as long as everybody has their own space. Um, you know, our, all of our, well, almost all of our angels are inside. Gabriel was outside looking over our garden for a long time. Um, I have a couple that stay outdoors and for those guys, it, it's just, their energy is a little too intense to have in the house all the time. Um, so they are, and they're more nature-based spirits. So they really rather enjoy being out in that space rather than in a closed up house. So when you are, when you're interacting with, um, various beings, 
you, you mentioned that they almost seem physical on certain encounters. Um, are they the same size as you? Mm -hmm. Are they larger than you? Are they, are they in the same space that you're in or do they, do they seem to be opening up to us to a separate space that they're coming in through? What is your experience like? I've had all of those experiences at one time or another. Um, and I really think it depends on why they're there. Um, like the fir very first time I saw Thoth, uh, Raphael had brought him. Um, and this is how I knew I was going into the Golden Dawn later on. Mm -hmm. um, but Raphael had come to me first uh, two or three times, and he was very, very large. And, um, you know, yellow robes, you'd see the, the purple uh, flashing colors just like on the edges of his robes. And he, and I always thought it was odd that he was not very talkative. And um, since then, I found out that sometimes he's that way. He, he's just kind of there as, as, in that respect, almost like a gatekeeper. Um, which for Mercury would be, would be appropriate, mm -hmm. but it was almost like he was coming to prepare me for what was coming next. And then I was, I was sitting at my drafting table one night, I was doing a series of, uh, paintings on papyrus at that point. And I could feel the air in the, in the room change. Have you ever been not really paying attention and somebody comes into the room and you can feel them walk in mm. it's a lot like that um except it's even it, it sometimes it just raises the hairs all over your body it's amazing it's sure it's amazing once you get used to it it used to freak me out um but whenever he came he was thoth was huge i mean and i could just see the outline because he was standing in a doorway i could just see the outline of the door frame, but he was kind of superimposed through it. <laughs> but it was, it was, I, I, don't, I don't even know really quite how to describe it. It was almost like watching a movie and seeing something materialize out of nowhere. And I can only think that people that have developed that style, that idea in visual media have, have seen something like that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've noticed amongst a lot of magicians, both amongst the people who I've talked to uh, in this interview series and in the world, is that they very often sort of um, depend upon their, uh, their spouse or significant other as the, the seer for themselves, and they, they prefer to operate as the sort of like, you know, the, the ritual conductor of things. Is that the relationship that you and Aaron have? Um, sure. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, he is not as visible. Oh yeah. So do you do you intercede uh, on behalf of his ancestors as well? Are they speaking to you and you share things with him, or does he does he feel connected with his ancestors in a in a uh, communicative way it as well? It, I think not. It has happened. It has absolutely happened. Um, were they, were they tap I on your shoulder? When I first started reading tarot. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, they will. <laughs> uh, there was a while where I was using his, he has his grandmother's uh, Smith Weight Rider deck. Mm. And I was using that deck for a long time. And there were times whenever his grandmother would come in and participate. And the first couple of times I ha I, that happened, I was like, Oh, well, that's new. I didn't know that could happen, but here we go. <laughs> and it was, it was very definitely, she even, she, at one point she told me who she was and it was almost like I could feel her selecting cards for me and, and giving me little messages. It was, it was very, very interesting. It surprised the hell out of me to begin with though. <laughs> But that, that isn't a constant thing. That was just a period that that, that, that happened in or does that still happen? No, there have been, it does happen on occasion. Um, 
but it's not something that's that's frequent. Um, it's usually only whenever there is something really big going on, and they're like, "Hey, this you need to to let them know this is going on." So, but I'm the one. I'm he doesn't really work with his ancestors the way that I do yet. <laughs> so. Uh, you you when when you guys do ritual together is is there often a situation where you're sort of sitting and and seeing things while he is asking questions and you're sort of acting as a medium in the in the process is that a frequent mm -hmm. occurrence between the two of you yes oh absolutely absolutely and in those cases when you're actually having fact, a cuz he's oh. sorry folks Little delays here. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's okay. He's he's not very visual, uh -huh. so it really helps him to have someone that can see. Um, and I can also see how this relationship developed over hundreds of years, where you have the seer conjurer relationship, mm -hmm. because you know the conjurer is supposed to be reading psalms or prayers or doing this or that, asking the questions. And that way the seer can just concentrate on what is going on. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? You know, it's, it's kind of a five senses plus kind of deal. So it's nice to be able to, to put your concentration on that rather than constantly having to worry about, I need to read this now. Okay, am I seeing anything, you know? You don't have to stop and go like sure. wherever you have two people working together. When you are communicating with a being, um, do you you have an auditory as well as a visual relationship with them most of the time, or is it mostly visual? Yeah, most of the time. No, most of the time I can hear them too. Um, I've I've had experiences with feeling them, seeing them smelling them um sometimes like um each one very much has their own smell to them too so sometimes you know i'm going through my day and i'm not really paying attention and i will and i'll smell um like copal or benzoin or something and i'm like somebody burning something no oh and you you kind of i kind of start focusing in and it's like oh well michael's wandering around um the uh spirit that i have my familiar through paulo she has a very particular smell too mm. um and i can tell my certain ancestors through their smell but yeah it's it's kind of a whole whole body thing i've had spirits touch me um not in any way inappropriate uh, but just any way they can get your attention at a at a given time especially if you're not really focused on them at that point well i mean that makes sense they're wanting to reach out so they're contacting you in whatever way they can would you say would you say smell is one of your stronger senses it exactly. seems like it comes up frequently Yeah, I, that's how I notice a lot of them because, you know, just going through my day, I'm not really thinking about who's here, who's doing this, who's doing what. And that the smell is most frequently whenever I'm not in rich, just my day to day life. That is most often what my first cue is that somebody's there. And then I can stop and say, okay, who is this? Sometimes I'll get a little message. Um, and they just go on sometimes it's like you know hey you we haven't had any offerings or any you know incense or water for a while can can you go do this now so that, you know that, it's is, just it's really interesting how we all communicate is that usually an auditory experience when they communicate that sort of thing with you or is it more just a feeling that comes over you and you understand that that's the communication again it just depends some most of the time it's it's visual and feeling mm -hmm. like i'll get flashes of images in my head um sometimes they'll be so so much that it's like 
I'm standing in that space and time rather than in my house. Um, but sometimes it's strictly auditory. Um, those still kind of <laughs> tend to freak me out sometimes. Sure. You, know, you just feel it, it, you just hear something from kind of back off and it's like, well, okay, was not expecting that. Give me a little warning next time. <laughs> And, and when you do have those auditory encounters, where, where, where do they seem to be coming from most of the time? You were pointing in a direction just now. Is that where usually it comes from, sort of over here? Yeah, usually, yeah, usually it's kind of like back, right back kind of behind my head. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it seems to come just kind of within my skull. Um, but most often it's kind of back in this area, like those just whispering the in my ear. Those are the ones that are the disturbing ones though, right? <laughs> when it's in your when it's in your head, you can go, okay, that's I can I can deal with yeah. that. But it's when it's like <laughs> that, that, was that an actual sound or is that just a spiritual sound? Right there. Okay. So um I, I wanna talk to you exactly. a little I wanna talk to you a little bit about practical magic. I know you and Aaron um do a, a significant amount of petition work uh for people at this point. Um, is that primarily just done at like at the devotional altar where you just sort of place a petition and and amongst the offerings and that's that's how you you're working? Uh, most of the time, um, we do um, sometimes we'll write out the petition most often, and it's a conversation that we're having with the angel because mm -hmm. um, we you know we'll open up the altar. Um, and we'll dress and fix the candle that, you know, the little kind of candle that we're working with. Um, but sometimes like tonight I had to, this was actually personal work I had to do with Samuel that because I was getting ready for this, I had him do for me, <laughs> which is a little unusual, but I had to, I had to write out a petition and be like, yeah, I, I need this little problem taken care of for me. Um, but you know even if we have a written out petition on the altar amongst you know the candle or under the the candle itself um we will always vocalize what the petition is and um you know ask for their help and be like you know this would be really good if this could work like this and you know just kind of plant little ideas most of the time they tend to work in their own ways anyway but it's like you know there's definitely a physical basis and the the auditory basis to it and and do you usually find that you're getting an answer back from them or do you just trust that the that the message has been sent uh well whenever we're doing work with clients we actually do a little three card reading to see if they have any messages or advice or anything like that. And it really surprises me how often we do get very clear messages or very clear advice from the angels. And, um, and you, are you still using that rider? Ago, are you still using that rider weight deck that you mentioned or a different deck now? Um, actually, Aaron's using that one now um, because I read so much generally. Um, I went and got a, a new deck and consecrated it and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, you wanted to so tell a story. Go ahead. His, his, he's reusing his grandmother. <laughs> it was just, um, and I, I forget now who, who he was doing. I think it was to Raphael, but he had done a petition for a client. And he did the three card reading and sometimes he'll bring them to me and say, you know, can can you figure out what this is saying mm -hmm. and sometimes it's like oh well this is this and i wish i can't remember what the cards were now but i got a message that was slightly separate from the cards and it was it was something about i think this person was trying to take a test or something and it looked everything looked wonderful for them to go on and pass this test but I kept getting this, this, again, it coming from back here, just this nagging, you need to tell them to make sure to slow down, to pay attention to, but that wasn't necessarily what was expressed in the cards. Mm. And so Aaron went back to the client with the message in the cards. And then 
It was like, oh yeah, and Carrie also says that you need to be careful of, of this. And she was like, I'm so glad you guys brought that up. Because <laughs> she apparently has a tendency to get nervous and rush through things. Right. And everything, as far as I know, as far as I can remember, came out really well. But it was just kind of an additional, she needs to make sure not to, not to rush through and to double check her work as she goes through. So that was, that was kind of a neat little message that I got a, almost an immediate back. Yeah, this is an immediate confirmation back. Yeah, and something different than, than the divination or additionals of the divination. Right, right. So, so um, sometimes that, that kind of still surprises me. So you're, you're starting to have a, uh, a, a rough camping venue at your property. Um, what, what, what do, how, is, how is that laid out? Do you have like showers and stuff set up for people? and? How is that all going to work? Yeah, uh, we do have uh, showers set up now and a, a propane run water heater. There's sinks on the side. Um, one of the, the first vessel that we plan to have uh, is Phoenix Fire. And um, we've already had the date set a couple of times, but because coronavirus, everything yeah. had to be canceled. But yeah, those folks came out and um, built it up, and it looks and works wonderfully. What do you guys? There's also a little bit of uh, access for electricity out there now too. What do you guys um, see as being, you know, when when coronavirus is going to be behind us? I mean, technically, we both live in Florida, so there's no there's no rules anywhere. <laughs> it's, it's the old west down here, but uh, when, when you. <laughs> When do you see oh, yeah. it being it being viable to actually have events starting to happen there? Um, I do think folks are probably going to give it a try come March. Oh, okay. Um, but I just I don't personally I don't see that really actually happening, at least in any large way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it will be at least October before we can even come close to having real festivals, real, real gatherings event. again. And, are, and you're having Phoenix Fire, are you, yeah. also, gonna, are you mm -hmm. also gonna host Florida Pagan Gathering or, or, or have you, are you in negotiations with them or where do you see that going? I think right now they are, I think right now they're trying to stay a little closer to the Tampa area. Um, Cause I know some folks have some difficulty traveling sure. a long way and difficulty with primitive campsites. And since we are so far from everything, you know, I, I think they're kind of trying to uh, stay a little bit closer. But, you know, as time goes on, and especially as we get past um, this whole virus thing, who knows who will be coming up here at that point or down or what have you. I've, uh, I've actually had several people contact me from South Georgia area wanting to look into leasing the property for festivals and stuff. Um, these the two that I'm thinking, I don't think they're even established yet. They're just looking at trying to start something up and start looking for a venue. So well, there will be more. So um, are, how much of the area of your property is cleared and how much is sort of foresty or swampy? Um, we have 20 acres of hayfield and mm. then actually it's about 17. And then we have 17 or 18 acres that are forested. And usually, whenever we're not kind of in the middle of a little drought, um, part of the lake that we live on actually comes up into the property too. So we have, it's a spring fed lake, so we have access to water people or fit, uh, whenever we've had people out just on um, little weekend camping trips over this last year, um, people have gone fishing and caught fish out of the lake and stuff, it's awesome. Um, but there's plenty, plenty of shade cover on, and the forested area is where, excuse me, where we have people for the festivals. Um, that's where the showers are. That's where the, the, the extra power is, everything. So it's even in summer, 
even as hot as it gets, it's going to be very, very pretty out here. Is it, does it have a big sort of open space for like the main rituals and vendors and stuff like that? Do you have that kind of laid yeah. out? Yeah, we have a fire circle already laid out. Um, there's been a couple of fires down there, small ones. Um, most everybody that we've talked to, there's um, kind of a, a path through, a straight path through a bunch of very old oak trees and hickory trees. And that seems to be where a lot of people want to set up to vend. Um, and then there's also plenty of space for people to spread out and uh, put their tents under trees or what I it's got space enough for everyone well it sounds very exciting so we have no worries about we have no worries about setting anything on fire we have plenty of open space for ritual I, we could fit a good number of people out there so i'm really looking forward to it i can't wait to see all the people coming enjoying Solomon Springs because this this place is very special to me in a number of ways. So this is actually um, my third great grandparents. This was part of their original homestead. Oh, wow. So it still has a, a it's a huge family connection. I have several ancestors buried just across the lake in a, a cemetery there. So you know this this land is very important to me this land is very sacred to me and i cannot wait to be able to share this with others because it's so beautiful and so primitive and just talk about nature spirits just kind of walking around and having their way it's it's amazing <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.